Hello, hello, folks. Welcome to part two of this video in which we are looking at five Pan-African guests who were there at the Zimbabwean Independence Day celebration in 1980, April 1980. If you haven't watched part one, I'll put the link in the description. Be sure to watch that first. That dropped uh, just 24, 48 hours ago. It's the last video on this channel. Um, initially, this was supposed to be one long video, but after I recorded the audio, I realized that uh, it ran a little too long. So I just split the video into two. So this is the second one of that two parts docu series. So thank you so much for joining me and enjoy, and I'll see you at the end. Our fourth and penultimate profile today is that of the first female prime minister of India who served three consecutive terms between 1966 and 1967. Then again in 1980, uh, at which point she obviously visited uh, Zimbabwe for the Independence Day celebrations. And if you know anything about anything, you guessed it, we are talking about Indira Gandhi. Now, the immediate question that would jump out is, why would an Indian prime minister show up on a Pan-African list? And this is very important here because while obviously she is not a member of the larger Pan-African community as we understand it, uh, they are very important. I figured I would take this time to emphasize other connections that were very important to the anti-colonial struggle and the uplift of what we call the quote-unquote third world of which her father was, was fundamentally responsible for. Now, historically, there has been some symbiosis in the struggle of, of, of Indian people, people from the Indian subcontinent, and those of, 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 of African descent as victims of, of, of British and European imperialism for the better part of the of the 20th century as well as in the case of these uh, of, of the indian subcontinent going back to the early 19th century if we're talking about colonialism proper um so there's been that connection some of those connections we also see early on uh with the natal indian congress in south africa which worked with uh groups such as the african national congress throughout the 20th century, and they were founded early in the, in the 20th century as well. Even though reports have come out uh, recently talking about uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, racism, but that's a different, that's a separate conversation. I think it's an important, but it's a separate conversation. The important thing is these movements uh, worked in tandem. And actually the Natal Indian Congress was also closely aligned with the Indian National Congress in India, which is uh, the party that Indira Gandhi would go on to lead. Oh, so full disclosure. So her last name is Gandhi and we'll talk about how we get there. But she is actually the daughter of the first prime minister of independent India, um, Jawaharlal Nehru. I'm sorry, I butchered that the first name, but Nehru, as we commonly know him, was her father. Um, and Nehru is very, very influential, um, very, very influential. He was one of the founders of the Afro-Asian movement in 1955 in Bandung, uh, as well as principal, principal, principal to the founding of the non-aligned movement, right, which was the, which was founded in 1961. And this, this was the collective of nations that stood, um, in that space between the U.S. on one side of the Cold War and the Soviet Union on the other side of the Cold War. And essentially, this is where the term the Third World comes from. Uh, now, I know we associate it, I might have said this earlier in the video, we associate it with the poorer countries, but it only really just means that the countries who were either all the way with the U.S. and all the way with... Uh, with the Soviet Union. And among the founding nations here, you have uh, India, of course, under the leadership of Nehru, uh, Ghana, under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah, Cuba, and Egypt, and so forth. Her grandfather, Indira Nehru's grandfather, had been Motilao Nehru, 
who himself had been one of the pioneers of the independence movement in India and was a close associate of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so this is the tradition out of which she comes. And, you know, her father, like I said, would go on to found the National uh, a Non-Aligned Movement in 1961, which supported freedom movements in Africa, including Zimbabwe and the anti-apartheid movement and so forth. So these were very important people to the independence movement. So let's talk a little bit about, about Indira herself. Uh, born in 1917, she attended for one year each the Visva Bharati University in, in India, as well as the University of Oxford uh, in England, obviously. Came back home and joined the Congress Party, which is the party that had come out of the the Indian National Congress. In 1942, she married Feroz Gandhi, who was a fellow member of the party, and this is where she gets her last name, Gandhi. So she's not a Gandhi by way of Mahatma's bloodline, but, you know, she's a Nehru. She's in that Nehru uh, royal bloodline, if you will, and they use royal in, in quotes here. Uh, but she was married to a Gandhi, and she had two children, Sanjay, Sanjay and Rajiv. Going into the 1960s, uh, while supporting the, the movements in, in the anti-colonial movements in, 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 in Africa, you know, they were also very vocal in, in using um, cricket as a form of resistance. So in the late 1960s, when anti-apartheid sentiment and protests began to resonate loudly, the international cricket community was split along ethnic imperial lines. Australia and England maintained the apart that apartheid South Africa should remain a part of the ICC, while the West Indies and Asian countries, prominent among them India, called for the expulsion and boycott of international cricket as long as they were involved in, 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 in apartheid. So you see this, it wasn't just the support of, of militarily, but even culturally, right, for, for the independence of Africa as a whole, as represented in this case by, by, by cricket. So she has joined the party in 1938. She goes on to rise to the top and in 1966, after her father has passed away, she becomes the, the president, the prime minister. And, and she would go on to rule until 1977, as we've already said. And, and and among her many initiatives were she supported East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh as it became as it became independent from Pakistan and established in 1971. She did a lot of different things, right? Um, then in 1977, she was kicked out of the party, and even briefly imprisoned between October 1977 and December 1978 on charges of official corruption. When new elections were held, Gandhi and the Congress, which was now called the Congress I, I for Indira, were swept back into power in a landslide victory. And her son, Sanjay, became a chief political advisor. And all the legal cases against them were, draw, were withdrawn. Her son, Sanjay, who was by many viewed as a potential successor, sort of continuing this Nehru, uh, uh, Gandhi, bloodline in Indian leadership uh, faithfully died in a car in, a, in an airplane crash in June 1980 a couple of months after the Zimbabwean independence and uh, after that Indira began to groom her son Rajiv for the leadership of the party and he would eventually to take over and we'll talk about that shortly but let's talk a little bit about her in Zimbabwe right Gandhi first met Mugabe during the Independence Day celebrations. So you think they would have met before, but no, they actually met at the Independence Day celebrations. And uh, the invite was handed to when Robert Mugabe met with Natwa Singh, who was the external affairs minister in India, uh, who wrote about this in his book, Walking with Lions. Um... You know, and and, and, and and this is, and I quote what Natwa Singh says from the 1979 meeting with, with, uh, with Mugabe. Before leaving, I asked Robert Mugabe, Sir, could I tell Mrs. Gandhi how much you are looking forward to greeting her in an independent Zimbabwe? And Mugabe said, 
Of course, of course. Do tell her. I admire her and a great age father, he replied. So, so of course, that's how she ended up over there and being part of the the larger celebrations and representing sort of the Indian subcontinent and the third world and the non-aligned movement in that moment. Furthermore, and their relationship didn't just stop there, right? Because she was so prominent in the non-aligned movement, she hosted the movement in 1983. Okay, she hosted the movement, uh, the, the summit, sorry, the movement summit in 1983. It had been held in several different places prior to this, Havana included, and now it was in New Delhi. And while it was happening there, there were huge, there was a huge debate between Castro, who in 1983 wanted to continue to, even though it's non-aligned, a lot of Soviet people had come to New Delhi and were sort of feeding their propaganda as a last-ditch attempt to, to save, uh, to win, quote-unquote, the Cold War. And, and, and Castro was walking that line, uh, which was uh, antithetical to the whole essence of the idea of the non-aligned movement, or that we're not going to take sides. So he found himself self at odds with uh, Raja Ratnam, who was uh, the uh, who was a representative of Singapore, who was really speaking more about the need to transition towards capitalism. I bring this two up because one of the things that she that Gandhi did was to masterfully mitigate these debates, right, both in public and in private, such that it kept the non-aligned movement. Um, working together a little bit longer. So she was that brilliant a states person and, and diplomat as well. Uh, in 1986, actually, interestingly, it was Mugabe, you know, Zimbabwe under Mugabe that succeeded India under, in, uh, you know, uh, as the chair of the non-aligned movement at the Harare summit. However, uh, unfortunately, it would not be Indira Gandhi who handed over the the reigns to Mugabe, it would be her son, Rajiv. During the late early 1980s, Indira Gandhi had been faced with threats to the political integrity of India. Several states had sought a larger measure of independence from the central government, and Sikh separatists in Punjab used violence to assert their demand for an autonomous state. In 1982, a large number of Sikhs, led by Bindranwale, occupied and fortified a go the Golden Temple Complex in Amitsar, which is the Sikh's holiest shrine. Tensions between the government and the Sikhs escalated, and in June 1984, Gandhi ordered Indian Army to attack and remove the separatists from the Golden Temple. Some buildings in the shrine were badly damaged in the fighting, and at least 456 were killed. Although the six, when if you ask the six themselves, that number is much higher. Five months later, Gandhi was killed in a garden, in a in a flurry of bullets fired by two of her own six bodyguards in revenge revenge for the attack. That is pretty interesting. I've always found that pretty interesting, and I'm not a scholar of Indian history or, or anything. So I'm not sure how this would go. But I found it very interesting that given those separatist ideals and the conflict with the Sikh, that she would have continued to have Sikh bodyguards that close to her, knowing very well that the anger from within that community towards her. Uh, but perhaps she thought that, you know, folks were different or that she was, uh, she was safe anyway. In any case, that's how her story comes to a tragic end. She was succeeded in office by her son, Rajiv, who himself was uh, killed by a Tamil rebel in 1991 while on a campaign rally. Okay, so if you know anything about the Zimbabwean Independence Day celebrations and Pan-Africanism, you have to know this was coming. You have to know I was going to end on this tip. And that is with the tough gong himself, the Buffalo Soldier, Robert Nestor Mali.
better known as Bob Marley. So let's talk a little bit about him here before we get to the exciting part about his, his performance, which itself from organization to the performance itself was just fascinating. So Robert Nesta Marley was born in 1945, February 1945. You know, he's considered by many to be one of the pioneers of reggae music and became a popular cultural icon. Um, a, you know, a Rastafari icon, a global symbol of Jamaican music and culture and identity while also being a huge proponent of Pan-Africanism. Mali began his, oh, before we get there, just to, you know, a lot of you may know this, some of you may not. Uh, so Bob Marley is biracial, right? His father was a white man born in the UK. His name was Novo Marley. Uh, Bob Marley doesn't seem to hold him in high regard. If anything, he was often very scathing. Novo split with Bob's mom a little bit after Bob was born and he died when Bob was 10. So uh, there's, there's that. In fact, one of his nicknames was actually White Boy in reference to that. So he does have that, 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 uh, you know, that British heritage to him, even though he was obviously very Pan-Africanist. And I once had a, a mentor of mine from the reggae world make fun of him and say, like, you, you know, when, if you ever see Bob Marley dancing, it's pretty ridiculous. You know, he may have just been uh, high on something, but uh, the guy had made a joke that, like, yeah, that's his white side showing, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. In any case, um... In 1963, Marley began his professional music career uh, when he formed Bob Marley and the Wailers alongside uh, the legendary Peter Tosh, as well as the recently deceased Barney Whaler, um, Mr. Livingston, uh, Barney Whaler. And the group released his debut studio album, The Wailing Wailers, in 1965, which had the uh, hit single uh, One Love, When People Get Ready. Uh, song was popular worldwide and really made them sort of put them uh, front and center of the of the of the of the reggae world. Then in 1960, in 1970, but the group began touring right after the couple albums, uh, including Catch a Fire and Burning, which were both released in 1973, went went uh, popular globally. Then they spent some time in the U.S. Right, these Jamaican kids who are starting to make a name for themselves in reggae music spent some time in the U.S. where they were scheduled, the Whalers were scheduled to open 17 shows for Sly and the Family Stone. After four shows, the band was fired because they were more popular than the acts they were opening for. So that's crazy and just speaks to how talented these guys were. Uh, the Whalers disbanded in 1974, which each of the three are going on to have a very successful solo career. Peter Tosh is often regarded as the more radical of the group. Uh, Bob Marley, if you can believe it, because to many people he's actually pretty radical, but he was actually the more mild of the three, you know, uh, but definitely um, more internationally known. And uh, Bob Marley went on to release his solo, out, you know, after a few years later, uh, the following year, Bob Marley began to use... Uh, the name uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers, even though the group had disbanded. And he released a couple pro uh, albums, Natty Dread in 1974 and Rastaman Vibration in 1976. A few months after after that Rastaman Vibration, uh, Bob Marley survived an assassination attempt uh, at his home in Jamaica, which has long been said to have been the work of, 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 the, of the Jamaican government. And... And think about that. Think about that. That this assassination attempt was again the work of uh, of uh, of uh, of the Jamaican government, the same government that had banned uh, Walter Rodney uh, less than a decade before, and the Guyanese government, which is a different Caribbean government, had revoked Walter Rodney's um, appointment at the at the University of Guyana. So all this to say. A lot of us in the Pan-African community who are not from these spaces may think of the Caribbean as a whole as sort of bastions of Pan-Africanism and revolution, right? But you have to understand that the government is still the government. The man is still the man, right? Uh, and uh, even in, in even post-liberation, post-independence in those places, these figures are still rising up against 
their black governments, right, who are still sort of these uh, stewards of, of neo-imperialism and so forth. Anyway, so after that assassination attempt, in fact, I think he was shot with, uh, with his wife, um, Rita, who uh, the story goes that because she had this, these thick dreadlocks, uh, you know, that they actually repelled the bullet. I don't know how far true that is, but that's the narrative that's been going around lately. Look that up. So during his so during his time in London, he recorded the album Exodus, which we will talk a little bit about because that that's a seismic album, right? one of the most famous albums, not reggae albums, but just one of the famous albums of all time. Marley was a Pan-Africanist and believed in the unity of African people worldwide. His beliefs were rooted in his Rastafari religious beliefs, which, by the way, he had been introduced to Rastafari as a religion. By his wife Rita, uh, who was Rita Anderson earlier on, but became Rita Marley, of course, when they got married. And Rita Marley had been, as a little girl, had been at the airport when Haley Selassie I visited Jamaica in that famous visit that initiated the the, the birth of the Rastafari movement. Um, and so when she started dating Bob, she schooled him to to put him on game. And thus he became a Rastafari as well. Um, he was substan substantially inspired by Marcus Garvey and had anti-imperialist and pan-Africanist themes in many of his so songs, such as Africa Unite, Zimbabwe, Exodus, Survival, Black Man Redemption, and Redemption Song. In fact, the song Redemption Song urges the listener, right, as you remember, Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. I'm sorry he had to live through that, but uh, those lines were lifted directly from a speech given by Marcus Garvey at Menelik Hall in Nova Scotia in 1937. So this is very profound, right? Because the Redemption Song is one of his most popular songs, if anything, because it's... I don't play the guitar, but it sounds like a very easy tune to play on the guitar if the annoying uh, acoustic guys at parties are anything to go by. Uh, Mali held that the independence of African countries from, from Western domination was victory for all those in the African diaspora. And uh, he, again, he talks about that in, the, in those songs that I listed earlier. So this became, this came to the forefront uh, with the release of his 1979 album Survival, which is uh, probably his most politically defiant album in, in, you know, in his catalog. And it includes the songs, as I spoke about, Africa, Unite, and Zimbabwe. Mali had specifically written Zimbabwe in support of the independence uh, fighting rebels, right? The, the, the Zipra and Zanla fighters in the, in the, in the Rhodesian bush, so to speak. Uh, and he debuted uh, the song at the Amandla concert in Boston, USA, to support the South, South African anti-apartheid struggle. And again, this is just to emphasize that the struggle against apartheid in South Africa was never separated from the struggle in independence in, 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 in Rhodesia. You know, until after Rhodesia became independent, then, you know, it became the last major fight on the continent. So let's talk a little bit about, about that trip to Zimbabwe. Now, there were debates after it was, you know, as people started to plan for, uh, as the planning committee for the Independence Day celebration started to put it together, there were debates. And one of the things that, that may be surprising, but maybe not so much, is the fact that there was one person who was opposed to having Bob Marley come perform. Even though he was this huge Pan-Africanist, even though he had a song named Zimbabwe, which was hot in his catalog, there was one person who was opposed to it. Who do you think it was? Was it Ab Was it uh, Was it uh, Reverend Abel Mzorewa? Was it Ian Smith? Was it Prince Charles? No. If you guessed Robert Mugabe, a fellow Bob, you were right. Bob, one of the most archetypal Pan-Africanists of all time, right? I'm talking about Bob Mugabe here did not want Robert uh, Nesta Mali to perform at Zimbabwean independence. Sounds crazy, right? Uh, in fact, he said about, about Bob, uh, he was too scruffy 
and unkempt. And in fact, Bob Marley suggested, I mean, Robert Mugabe suggested that we have Cliff Richard, the clean-cut British man, white man, come to, uh, to perform instead. Uh, but the comrades were not having it, especially one Edgar Tekere, who was uh, Mugabe's longtime ally during the war, famously fell out after the independence, but he is the one who made it happen. From Zimbabwe, Mr. Edgar Tekere gave the letter inviting Bob Marley to come to Zimbabwe's independence to Job Kadengu and Gordon Muchanyika and asked them to deliver the letter in person. When they arrived at, at, at Bob's home in Kingston, Jamaica, um, you know, they were told that uh, Bob was away playing soccer but would be back shortly. The gentleman volunteered to wait in, uh, for Mr. Mali, uh, you know, whereupon they were given seats and waited. You know, about an hour later, Bob got home and, he, you know, he saw the guys and they introduced themselves and told them that they had brought this letter from, Zimbab from the Zimbabwean government and uh, handed it over to him. Bob sat down and went through the letter in silence. After reading the letter, Bob Marley wrote himself a blunt, uh, you know, uh, marijuana to those of you who are uncultured. Uh, he took a few puffs and uh, passed it to Gordon, uh, Gordon Muchanyuka. And Gordon didn't smoke, so he was going to decline it uh, and give it back to Bob. But then his partner, uh, Job Kadengu, uh, said in Shona, take a drag, man. Otherwise, this guy will refuse to come to Zimbabwe. <laughs> that done, uh, you know, uh, Gordon handed the, 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 the spliff uh, to, to his partner, Bob, who took a drag as well before passing it back to Bob. With that done, Bob said he was honored to with the invite and uh he would perform if, you know this was a pretty short notice you know he would perform on independence day bob marley was not only accepted the invitation but he was so honored that he spent tens of thousands of dollars to fly his band and its equipment to take part in the festivities the, on the evening of april 17. you know think about that because at this point the Zimbabwean government, the Rhodesian government, is coming out of uh, a period of war and, and, and sanctions. So they were broke. And these guerrillas coming out, becoming the government, have uh, what money do they have? You know, if anything, they're going to start building bank from there. They don't have excesses to be bringing arguably the biggest superstar in the world to Zimbabwe at that time, right? But in any case, so Bob came and he was such a spot. And there's a report here from, um, uh, you know, a UK best musician, Pax Nindi, who was a journalist uh, at the Herald uh, in Zimbabwe at the time, who met Mali a day before the concert. He described him as a very humble man, simple in demeanor. When the band was rehearsing in the stadium earlier, uh, Nindi, uh, you know, recalled the noise of the PA system being unlike anything they had ever heard in the ghetto of, of Mbare, which is the biggest uh, sort of township in, in Harare, uh, which neighbored the stadium. And this was the first inkling that many had that Mali was in town. People didn't know that he was in town. It was actually ironic, right, that Mali had been invited as many, you know, with the, with the idea of... Uh, of the likes of Mugabe being uh, uh, opposed to his coming and just the culture of, of Marasta as well because, oh, I, and I didn't say this about, about Mugabe earlier because the reason why he would have said that, right, is Mugabe, in addition to being a Pan-Africanist, he is a noted Anglophile, right? You always see him, Anglophile meaning that a lot of things about British culture he romanticized as much as he denounced imperialism and things like this uh so for example um upon independence he assumed the role as the, as the, the uh, unofficial president of zimbabwean cricket saying uh cricket uh is a is a, is a gentleman's sport and is one that we can use to further civilize our people in 1980 right that sounds like something fresh out of the colonial handbook and you see him uh in his suits all the time you know, he never spent any significant time in in, 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 um, in Europe, but he, you know, rumors have it that he would spend 
I was in front of the mirror, her practicing his, his British uh, accent, which is why he is very well spoken as far as that goes. Um, <laughs> so again, to have Bob Marley be the pinnacle of the celebrations is almost counter to what Mugabe himself and the general culture out of which it comes off would have would have uh, would have would have been expected to do. But again, there were the likes of Tekere who were more radical and uh, pan-Africanist in that cultural sense that felt this was a good idea. So let's get on to the performance. On the night of April 17, uh, his, you know, Bob Marley's performance for slot was immediately after the official flag raising. Indeed, some of the first official words in the new nation of Zimbabwe were, Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Marley and the Whalers. Yo. One of the, some of the first words heard in an independent Zimbabwe were that announcement. And remember that this was a four-hour celebration, so he didn't have too much time. If anything, I think he had been told he had 10 to 15 minutes. So there's a great account of that experience from Horace Campbell in the book Rust and Resistance. And I'll read from that because I haven't, as far as the performance itself, the details don't get better than this. And I quote, at 10.14 p.m., Bob Marley arrived on stage after the technicians had spent the previous two hours setting up the 40 tons of speakers, boxes, tweeters, mixers, lights, and other technological components that had been harnessed from the se for the circulation of reggae. Shouting, Viva Zimbabwe! as he came on stage, Bob Marley lifted the spirits of the audience as he moved straight into Rastaman vibration, following with the appropriate reminder of the inequalities, them belly full, but we're hungry. Rastafari culture beamed out to the delegates and presidents from 104 states who had gathered to witness the lowering of the last British flag in Africa. As Bob Bali moved into, I shot the sheriff, there was bedlam in the stadium. Everything seemed out of control. The policemen were running on the field, followed by the press, the band had stopped. The white Rhodesian police had dispersed tear gas on the throngs of the African workers outside the stadium who were pulled by the rhythms of family men, Aston Barnett, the, the bass guitarist. The whole stadium was covered in ga with tear gas. Order was only restored when guerrillas of Zimbabwean African National Liberation Army, Zanla, marched through the stadium with raised clenched fists reassuring the people that the Rhodesian police could not stop the celebration. So can you imagine this? The Bob Marley performance almost brought back the tensions of the war, right? With the Zanla troops marching in to tell them that these white Rhodesian cops no longer had the authority in this place. After that, Marley returned to stage after his 15-minute di uh, disruption and shouted, Freedom! A crisp English voice at the other end of the stadium said, Bob Marley, you have two ex uh, you have exactly two minutes left. And Bob Marley went on to sing war. Uh, and the people jammed and chanted with Marley that there will be war until South Africa is free. The exhilaration was the response of a people who were lifted out of the fear that the celebrations would be sabotaged by the racists who had said that black people in Zimbabwe would not achieve independence before the year 2035. The hard drumming bass of the band reverberated across the African sky as the band put everything into the music. And Marley wailed, we don't need no more trouble. All the energy, force, history and power of reggae filled the air as Neville Garrick, the dreadlocks engineer, frantically missed the music so that the sound from the 40 feet high boxes beamed out to all the people who could not get into the stadium. After 15 minutes of the supposed two minutes, <laughs> the whalers sang Africans are liberate Zimbabwe. In one section of the stadium, the whole gathering stood and joined in chanting this, this song of freedom, saying that they did not want to be fooled by mercenaries. It was an experience filled with emotion, and Bob Marley responded with the slogans of Pan-African unity, which were an essential part of his outlook on, on life. So, peep this. 
so that happens, right? And it's the star struck show that, that we, we hear it was today. But Bob Marley recognized that the Independence Day concert had not been accessible to the masses. And typically, and, and as a response, he therefore played a subsequent show the next day on actual on the 18th to an audience of over 100,000 almost exclusively black people. So he put on two shows back to back that he funded himself. Um, so just an incredible, incredible, incredible man uh, and an incredible performance against the backdrop of this of the of this of this uh of the leader of the new nation not wanting him there but people making a plan to get him there and there's a lot more stories told about him being told you know coerced to to stay on in zimbabwe for a little bit longer but i won't get into that here that's that's maybe further reading but he had a great time um in fact let's talk a little bit about his pan-africanism here because on that following day he told the audience that the next time he would perform in Africa, they hoped it would be in a free Azania, and Azania is uh, is is South Africa. That's the name that a select activist in uh, South Africa had used during the apartheid era for an independent South Africa. Uh, during the whole week they were in Zimbabwe, Mali and the Whalers operated as as ambassadors to Africa, uh, whether in the form of organizing friendly football matches, attending formal receptions. Uh, with high-ranking politicians, or in discussion with the guerrillas in the camps. Now, in all this, it's also important to talk about his enduring Pan-Africanism. And there's a couple of quotes here that I want to reference before I finish today. Uh, this is Bob Marley. I and I made our contribution to the freedom of Zimbabwe. When we say Nati going to dub it up in a Zimbabwe, that's exactly what we mean. Give the people of Zimbabwe what they want. Now they got what they want. Do we want more? Yes. The freedom of South Africa. So Africa, unite, unite, unite. You're so right and let's do it. And Rita Mali added her voice saying, I and I firmly believe that music is going to teach the world a lesson. Black women stand firm and keep the faith for your reward shall be great. Zimbabwe now, South Africa next. When all Africa is free, all black people will be free. So what, what happened to Bob Marley? In 1977, Bob Marley was diagnosed with acro lentiginous melanoma, <laughs> and, um, which is a cancer. And he died as a result of that illness in 1981. So mark him as a third person who died under tragic circumstances. Three of the five people we spoke about today uh, who died under strange circumstances immediately after Zimbabwean independence. There's a lot of conspiracy, of course, as when such a big name dies about him being poisoned by the CIA and so forth. I won't get into all of that just because it's, 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 uh, I have no proof of it, but, uh, he, you know, the official thing was, 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 was the cancer he developed, which started off, uh, uh in, in his, in his leg. Um, his fans around the world expressed their grief and he received a state funeral in Jamaica. Jamaica, the same country that a few years later, a few years before he tried to assassinate him. It's so neurotic. Uh, his greatest hits album, Legend, was released in 1984 and became the best-selling reggae album of all time. Marley also ranked as one of the best-selling music artists of all time, with estimated sales of more than 75 million records worldwide and counting. He was posthumously honored by the by jamaica soon after his death with a designated order of merit by his nation in 1994 he was inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame and rolling stone ranked him number 11 on its list of the hundredth greatest artists of all time what a man bob marley was just an incredible story of of sacrifice of, of pan-africanism and just for him to make it out and make this day as special as it was for the Zimbabwean people is incredible. And he is forever, especially with the song Zimbabwe, he is forever tied to the mythos of Zimbabwe. One more thing that I want to bring attention to uh, regarding the, the Battle of the Bobs. Read the lyrics of 
the song Zimbabwe by Bob Marley. You have such sections as this. No more internal power struggle. We come together to overcome the little trouble. Soon we'll find out who is the real revolutionary. Because I don't want my people to be contrary. Right? Another part. To divide and rule could only tear us apart. In every man's chest, mm, there beats a heart. So soon we'll find out who is the real revolutionaries. And I don't want my people to be tricked by mercenaries. Incredible insight into the, uh, into the apartheid conditions of Rhodesia. However, I wonder what Bob Marley would say as he witnessed what Zimbabwe had become later on with the Gukura Hundi massacres in, 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 in Matabele land in the early 1980s, uh, with the political violence of the 2000s, with, uh, a, a, and so forth, and these other things, that it almost seems like we are back where we started and we are now standing in a place where it's... Soon we'll find out who, the, who is the real revolutionaries. And a lot of the people that we had thought were revolutionaries then have, le had, have let the country down. I don't want to get too political. This is supposed to be informative. But in any case, I think the battle between Bob Marley and Bob Mugabe would have taken another step. And maybe they're duking it out in the great uh, Pan-African beyond right now. Um, so that's been my long drawn out presentation uh, video. Uh, it's been a labor of love. I've really enjoyed making this, preparing for this. And thank you guys for watching. And, um, you know, show some love. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. You like the video. You share it with somebody who will share it with somebody who will share it with somebody else uh, who will appreciate this. And thank you so much. And most importantly, happy Independence Day to Zimbabwe, 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 you know, land we love. Big Shingy out. <laughs>